Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Simon. I'm one of the ministers here, and I'm delighted to be sharing with you this morning. And over the last few weeks, we've been looking at a series on getting a vision. And uh, we considered getting a vision of the church, and then getting a vision for serving the Lord, and then getting a vision for prayer. And today, we're doing getting a vision of Jesus. And if you have a Bible, uh, a paper one, or on your phone, I do encourage you to turn to it, because we're going to tic-tac through uh, the passage that was read to us, and I want to highlight a few thoughts for us this morning. But first, let's pray. Lord, some of us have known you a long time, and some of us just a short time, and some of us are still searching for you. But we pray that we will all know you more, understand you more, see more of you because of today. Amen. Well, I wonder how you imagine Jesus or how you image Jesus. As a schoolboy 40 years ago, exactly 40 years ago, I was studying for my what was then O-levels sort of equivalent of GCSEs today, although I think they were very hard years ago. (laughs) I found them really hard. And uh, in English, we were studying William Blake's famous poem, Tiger. And Blake, in that poem, asked the question. He asks, did he who made the lamb make thee, tiger, tiger, burning bright? And later, the poet T.S. Eliot responded to Blake's poem. And in a poem that he wrote called Gerontium, he said this, In the juvescence of the year came Christ the tiger. How do you imagine or image Jesus? Now, St. John, who uh, we were reading about, hearing about in the reading then, knew Jesus and knew Jesus' face more intimately than any other of the disciples, I think. He'd been with him day and night for three years. He was there at the transfiguration where on the mountain the Lord was revealed in all his eternal glory before the disciples. He'd leant on his breast on the night that Jesus was betrayed. The rest sat and ate at a distance, but John was there leaning on his lover. And he was the one who was stood with Mary at the foot of the cross, watching as the loveliest life the world has ever known gave up his spirit, gave up his life for us. And then he was there in the upper room when the Lord Jesus suddenly appeared on Easter morning and appeared to them. And he was no ghost. He said, touch me and give me something to eat. But there was more of Jesus to know. And there was more of Jesus to see. And here, John experiences and encounters and sees a greater and deeper and more profound vision of Jesus. And we believe as a leadership that this is a season in which the Lord Jesus wants us to see more of him, to know more of him, to experience more of him, to see another side of him. Let's look at this passage. John's an old man, and he's in exile on the Isle of Patmos. He's here perhaps doing hard labor in the quartz mines that were there. And he has been exiled there, we read, verse 9, for his faithfulness to the word and for his witness to Jesus. He was faithful to the Lord, and he was sharing about that faith in the Lord. And that didn't go down well in a culture and in the context where there was a decree from the emperor that you worship the emperor, Domitian, as Lord. 
And those Christians who refused to worship Caesar as Lord were either killed or were exiled. And here is John. He's in exile on the island of Patmos for his faithfulness. He's suffering. He's taking up his cross. He's under pressure. He's facing a very real opposition and persecution for his faith. Following Jesus has never been a picnic. He was never a pillow. And those of you who choose to follow him faithfully and to witness to him to others will know some pushback in your life. But it's worth it. And we read in verse 10 that on the Lord's day, he says, I was in the Spirit. Throughout this passage, we see all sorts of symbols and the prophetic, but it's also very polemic. On the Lord's day, he says, I was in the Spirit. And the thing about Domitian was he set aside a day in the week just for himself as Lord. A day set apart to celebrate the emperor. So John here is being polemic and prophetic. On the Lord's day, which Lord? The Lord. The Lord of Lords. On the Lord's day, the first day of the week, On Sunday, the day when we remember as Christians Jesus Christ who rose from the dead and defeated sin, death, and hell and broke the power of those things to offer us life in all its fullness and life eternal. On the Lord's Day when we gather to celebrate, there he is. And he's in the Spirit. And he's honoring the Lord. Not the emperor, the Lord. Earlier this year, I did an interview with uh, a friend of ours called Baroness Berridge. And uh, I loved how this peer of the realm who sits in the House of Lords and uh, who's been a government minister and a whip, whenever she talked about Jesus, she had a particular title and she called him Sovereign Lord. Sovereign Lord. She sits in the House of Lords. She sits with all the lords of the land and all the ladies. She's a baroness, the female equivalent of a lord, only more important. And there she is, sovereign... Thank you very much. There she is, sovereign lord. On the sovereign lord's day, just like today. And it says he's in the spirit. What does that mean? Well, he's turning his spirit And he's joining his spirit with the Holy Spirit to commune with God. It's about an orientation and a devotion. He's in prayer and he's in worship and he's meditating just like we are today. And then all heaven breaks out. And we're told John hears the sound of trumpets. Now in the Old Testament, trumpets signified that God was about to speak. Very important. They were on on the mountain when God revealed the law to Moses. And they were to be blown on special and sacred days. And he hears a voice like the sound of trumpets. But it's also polemic. Because whenever the Caesars would enter different cities, they would have in front of them players of trumpets and giant tubers. Tubers. Blowing away announcing and heralding and signifying that the Caesar was coming. And it was called the fanfare of the king. The fanfare for the king. And here we have a fanfare of the king. He's on the Lord's day. He's worshipping the Lord. He's pressing in. He's seeking Jesus. And then he hears the trumpets. The king is coming. And I think this is a season when we're going to start hearing trumpets. Maybe not literally, but as it were spiritually, because the Lord is coming and wanting to reveal himself more to us. And then in verse 13, he says, I turn to see the voice. And then it says, it's a sort of repetition. It says, I turned and saw. If we turn to see, we'll turn and see. I turned to see and I turned and saw. 
We start with some poetry. We'll have a bit more in this sermon. The poet laureate, John Betjamin. I wish I knew all this stuff when I did really badly in my O-level all those years ago. The poet laureate, John Betjamin, wrote this. What is conversion? What is it, he says, turning round from chaos to a love profound? Turning round from chaos to a love profound. And that's what's going on here. He's turning round. He, it, the place is in chaos. The empire's in chaos. The world may be in chaos. But he's turning to a love profound. And maybe some of you today here, maybe some of you who are joining us online, maybe you just feel that it's just swirling chaos all around. You're on your back foot. You're under great pressure. And there's just chaos in your life. Turn around <laughs> to a love profound. He puts everything in order. Jenny Kaur, our ops director, pointed out this week that having, after 21 years, turned the church back facing east, many of you will know that we were facing south for the previous almost two decades, having turned to face east the way the church was designed and orientated, they're confronting us, they're awaiting us, they're welcoming us, is a picture in the stained glass window of Christ Pantocrata, Christ with his feet over the world, the risen Lord Jesus, who's coming to us and inviting us to come to him. And like I said, I think this is a season for us to turn and face the sun. It's for us to turn and to welcome Jesus who has turned to us first in love. I wonder if some here today, some of you watching online, maybe over the past couple of years you've turned away, perhaps not consciously, perhaps just the pressures and the exigencies of life. It's just been a kind of incremental turning, but you've turned away from him. And you're at a different angle from the Lord. You're not looking at him. Maybe just life and all its pressures, or maybe temptations, or maybe disappointments, or maybe doubts have come into your life, and there's been a turning away. And can you hear them trumpets? And the signal in the Lord wants to come to you and is inviting you to turn to him. What does he see when he turns? I mean, there's so much here that it would take me a year of Sunday sermons to cover it all in any really meaningful way. And even then, I'd, own, I'd be like capturing Niagara Falls in a teacup is just so rich with this beautiful vision of Jesus. But let me just highlight a few things. Seven, we're moving fast. And as I said, they're prophetic, they speak about Jesus and, his con and the context, and they're polemic. They're also challenging the context in which John finds himself under pressure because of his faithfulness and witness to Christ. The first thing is we see something of the intimacy of Jesus. Intimacy. It says verse 13, he, there was one standing among the seven lampstands. He's standing among them. The Greek word en miso. He's right in the middle of it. He's right in the thick of it. He's right up close and personal. He's stuck in at the center with them. Just as God walked among the trees in the Garden of Eden, so he wants to walk and to join with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. So he's always wanting to be at the center. So often in our life, we push him to the periphery. We just have him there as a kind of tag end. So it can happen in church life that Christ is at the periphery. But Christ wants to be at the center of your life. He wants you to be at the center of the church's life. And he wants the church to be at the center of the community's life. Christ at the center. The intimacy of Jesus. In the Old Testament, the seven branch lampstand symbolized Israel. God hasn't forgotten. God hasn't given up. God hasn't replaced Israel. But here we see that joined with Christ at 
the center of the church, which is symbolized by these seven lights. And we read later on in chapter 2 and chapter 3 that these churches are all over the place. Most of them, Jesus is having to tidy stuff up. He's having to point out some real problems. That there's sin, there's immorality, that there's a kind of mishmash blending with culture rather than with the faith and so on. That some of them have fallen asleep, some of them are lukewarm, but he's still there, standing in the middle. And it doesn't matter what sort of a year you've had, whether you've turned away, as it were, from him incrementally because of disappointment or because of doubt or because of temptation, whatever, he's still there. However you are towards him, he's still there towards you. Why? Because he loves you. And a relationship with you has never been predicated on your effort and the merit that you credit with him. It's always his moving towards you in love from all eternity. It's his church, and he's the head, and he's promised to never leave it or forsake it. What a wonderful thing. What a wonderful promise. There at the center. He's there at the center. And he's calling you to turn to him. And then secondly, John saw something of the humanity of Jesus. Verse 13, it goes on and says, one like a son of man. You'll be very familiar with this designation. It's actually the term that Jesus used most often for himself. It's how he he spoke about himself, how he revealed himself. He was never only that. He was far more than that. He was the Lord and he was the King and so on. And we're going to be exploring that on Wednesdays in our Jesus sessions, the nature and character, the person and the personality, the person and the work of Jesus. Do join us. This is going to be absolutely fantastic. The whole point of Wednesdays in the Jesus sessions is to turn towards the one, to turn again and turn and face the son who's turned to us. But here he underlines the fact he's the son of man, one like a son of man, not just the eternal son of God, not the eternal logos, not the rationalizing principle and power of the universe, but a son of man, one like us, one who understands us one who can sympathize, one who can empathize, one who's walked in our shoes, who understands, who knows of what we are made because he was made of the same stuff. And it speaks of his identification with us. Ours is not a remote God that we've got to get to on the basis of our effort. Ours is a God who becomes one of us, one like us, one with us, to be one uh, to spend eternity among us. He doesn't observe us from afar. He identifies and he stands shoulder to shoulders. I like country music. I've even got cowboy boots. And uh, one of my favorites is a wonderful singer. She's gone to be with the Lord called Nancy Griffiths. And she Uh, did a well-known song. Other artists did it, Bette Midler and so on, but the song is From a Distance. Remember that song, some of you? Some of you are old enough to remember it. And um, I don't know why I did that, but I just felt like doing it. And um, From a Distance, God is Watching Us. Sounds great. It's a lovely melody. The theology's rubbish. It's rubbish. He don't watch us from a distance. He gets up close and personal. It's the heart of the Christian message. God becomes one of us to be one with us. What an amazing thing. The world's got nothing to offer compared to that. And then thirdly, look at his ministry. It says that he was dressed in a robe with a golden sash. Again, as I said, this is all symbolic and prophetic and polemic. What does that mean? He's dressed in this robe. Is there any meaning in that? Well, we find that exact description in the Old Testament in Exodus. And there, the high priest. The high priest wore that long robe with a golden sash made of golden thread. 
And he's telling us that Jesus is our great high priest. What did the high priest do? On behalf of the people, on one day of the year, he went into the presence of God, carrying the people, as it were, on his breast, uh, symbolized by the 12 stones representing the 12 tribes. But he bore them, and he went in with blood as a sacrifice on the Day of Atonement to bring about unity and connection between God and the people. He's the one who mediates for them. He's the one who represents them before God, and the gold is a sim- symbolic of glory. He represents God before them. And here we have the Son of Man, one like us, who is the eternal Lord of glory, robed like the high priest that he is, our great high priest who offers a sacrifice, but he doesn't just take a lamb, he becomes the lamb. And he offers a sacrifice and mediates and expiates and propitiates God with God on our behalf in himself. It tells us of his ministry. Like I said, we could preach for a year on that, not just three sentences, but he's a priest. He's the one who stands between us and the Father, and in he's God for man, and he's man for God, and he brings the two together. He reconciles us in himself, in his body, on a tree. These are extraordinary things. These are the most profound things. It's why we sing. It's why we worship. Every other religion or faith system says, that there is a God and he is holy and you're not and you need to get yourself close to him on the basis of what you do. But Christianity fundamentally and radically differs in that it says God comes to us as one of us to bring us to him. His ministry. What a beautiful thing. And then fourthly, his purity. I'm moving fast. It says, verse 14, head and hair like wool, white as snow. I think it's a picture from Daniel. It may well refer to him as the ancient of days, the one born in time, created time from all eternity. It's an amazing thing. And it may speak about his wisdom, but I think it, it speaks of his purity more. He's the perfect one. He's pure. He's spotless. He's crystal clean, crystal clear. His purity, it shows up our impurities when we're before the one whose head and hair, like wool, are white as snow. The only other time in Scripture we read about white as snow is when it says, though your sins are red as scarlet, they will become white as snow. How? On the basis of the one who was white as snow, shedding his scarlet blood to make us white. His purity, but his purity advances towards us. It doesn't withdraw from us, and it moves towards us in love to make us pure. Our sins are red as scarlet, so he sheds scarlet blood to make us white as snow. Then his sensitivity. Verse 14, eyes were like blazing fire. Nothing escapes his gaze. Nothing is hidden. He sees it all. He knows every every little detail about you. He knows you better than you know you. He knows all your thoughts, all your actions, every word that's ever come out of your mouth, every intention and every motivation. He knows you. And he still loves you, even though he's seen all of that mix and some of that gunk that's there. To each of us, he says, I know you. That's what he says to the seven churches. I know, I know, I know, I know. He knows because he's got eyes that see. You can't hide from him, and he never hides from you. And he sees. He knows all about you. And he wants the best for you. He sees you in your bed, and he sees you in the car, and he sees you at the laptop, and he sees you at work, and he sees you walking around the garden. And he sees what's going on inside you. He sees how you feel and how you're thinking. He knows your longings. He knows all about you. And he's always only 
ever wanted the best for you. And the best can only happen when you're connected to him. Shakespeare's Romeo declared, here's what love is. Love is a fire burning in your lover's eyes. Lover's eyes. It's a fire burning. And in his eyes, he doesn't look at you with dread. He doesn't look at you with anger. He doesn't look at you with dis- He's never disappointed because he knows all about you from all eternity. He's already paid for it. So you can never disappoint him. You can never catch him out. He will never say, gosh, I didn't expect that from you. <laughs> and he looks at you with love. Some of you still living under condemnation because how your headmaster or your school teacher or your mother or your sibling or your ex-partner looked at you. And you can still feel that sense of shame, or dread, or a sense of shrinking. When he looks at us, we grow. And then sixthly, John saw Jesus' stability. Feet, verse 15, like forged bronze. Again, a picture from the Old Testament. John is just struggling to try and convey what he's seeing, and he's drawing on all these threads. And there we have a vision that represents the leading nations and empires over, uh, uh, well, millia, millennia and a half, I think. And it talks about them as having feet of clay. However grand, however powerful, however impressive, however prominent, whatever you know, display of grandeur and wealth and might over the other nations, they got feet of clay. Everything we build as feet of clay because we have, but here's one who has feet of bronze, strong and stable and reliable and permanent. A friend wrote to me in pain a while ago and wrote this, every authority figure in my life from my teenage years on has let me down. I struggle to think that there's anyone in authority that I can respect and trust. And I replied, don't be surprised. All men have feet of clay. And all will fail you in some way, even the best of them. Only Jesus has feet of burnished bronze. Only Jesus. Some of you have been looking to other things to hold you for stability. Only Jesus ultimately won't fail you. And then lastly, John sees the authority of Jesus. Verse 16, he held seven stars in his hands. I love that. The ancients believed that their lives were determined by the movements of seven planets. The seven major planets, Moon, Mercury, Venus, the Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and that the configuration of those planets determined the events of their lives. Absolute nonsense. There's a lot of that going on still today. This week I read a part of a report from the Astrological Society, and it said, then there were various quotes, here's two. Astrology allows people to give meaning to the chaos of their inner lives. How about that? Following the stars will give meaning to the chaos of your life. Someone else wrote, it's easier to transmit responsibility to the cosmos than to admit our own fault. Mm. He holds them. The stars don't hold your destiny. The one who made the stars does. He holds the stars. And then it says, out of his mouth comes a two-edged sword. This is the image of the famed and feared Roman fighting sword that actually in Latin was called a gladus, short fighting sword. And a gladiator is a swordsman. And he sees coming out of Jesus' mouth this Roman fighting sword, the sword that that symbolized the Roman Empire that had conquered the world that was feared and was famed. But that sword's coming out of Jesus' mouth. Who's the daddy? That's what he's saying. Who's in charge? 
Who's got the power? Who's got the might? Who's got the authority? It is Jesus. He has authority. He has the victory. There's so much more one could say. I encourage you to go and read it this week. I encourage you to join us on Wednesdays. Jesus' sessions. Turn and face the sun. What an astonishing vision. In C.S. Lewis's The Silver Chair, Jesus is portrayed not as Tiger Tiger, but as Aslan the Lion. From, Re- from uh, Revelation 5.5, 5, the Lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And it says this, they turned and saw the lion himself and everything else began at once to look pale and shadowy compared to him. The band would like to come up. A revelation requires a response. And we read in verse 17 that John says, I fell at his feet. I fell at his feet. You see, you don't stand in awe for too long when Jesus shows up. You fall at his feet. If he were to come here and reveal himself more, you'd be on your face, adoring the Lord. I'll finish with this. In the mid-1990s, a great pal of mine, Big Dave White, was preaching for eight successive days in uh, Denmark for a new wine set of conferences. And each night in the front row, there was a chap from the Middle East who would stand up in the middle of my pal's preaching and say, the presence of the holy is here. Who is he? The presence of the holy is here. Who is he? And my pal would say, just sit down and be quiet, and I'll tell you later. (laughs) And afterwards, he'd say to him, I'm preaching tomorrow at so-and-so town or city. Come, and I will tell you more about him. And for eight successive nights, as my pal was preaching, the bloke would sit in the front row, all agitated but engaged, and stand up. He couldn't help it involuntary. His spirit connecting with whatever this was. The presence of the Holy is here. Who is he? And on the last night, my friend said, it's Jesus. He was teaching, I think, on the spirit that week, but he says, Jesus, this is who you sense. This is who is wooing you. This is who is calling you. This is who you're drawn to. It's Jesus. Jesus of Nazareth, the eternal Son of God, made flesh, crucified for our sins, risen to demonstrate his lordship and power, reigning in heaven and waiting for you. Turn to him. And the guy became a Christian. He turned to Jesus, said, yes, to Jesus was filled with the Spirit, began singing in tongues. There was great joy in the house on the eighth day. And then he told David that he had to go back to Iraq because his job was Saddam Hussein's bodyguard. One wonders what God was doing. If you want to find out more, turn and face him. Join us online or join us at the Jesus Sessions on Wednesday. Jesus, it says, put his right hand on him. He is this great sovereign, majestic Lord, but he still puts his hand on us in tenderness and says, don't be afraid. And John said, yeah, right. Don't be afraid.